thank you to uh, everyone who has been joining us for the walk through the Passion Week. We've come to Friday, uh, the most holiest of days of the Holy Week, the day in which our Savior uh, was crucified, uh, a day of uh, great injustice that was done to him, a uh, day of uh, terrible suffering uh, that he endured. But this Friday is often called Good Friday. It might seem very ironic that a day of su such pain and suffering and, and difficulty for Jesus is so commonly known as Good Friday. What could be so good about it? Perhaps after we're done today, in a few minutes, we'll have a better understanding of why it was really good. All four Gospels tell of Jesus' crucifixion. Matthew chapter 27, Mark chapter 15, Luke, the end of chapter 22 and chapter 23, and John, the end of chapter 18, and into chapter 19. We will be taking, today we'll be taking uh, Matthew's Gospel as the basis for our, our reading. We will begin um, with the first event of Friday morning as found in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 1. Early in the morning, this is early Friday morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hung himself. The chief priest picked up, picked up the coins and said, It was against the law to put this uh, money into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the thirty pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded. So very early in the morning, this is after they had a mock trial, an illegal trial in the middle of the night. Very early in the morning, the Jewish leaders are now going to take Jesus to the Roman officials. And the reason for this is quite simple. The Jewish people, uh, they did have their own courts and could see to their own affairs, but they were under the Roman government. And the Roman government had forbade them had forbade them to uh, carry out the death sentence, carry out capital punishment. So, since they wanted Jesus to die, they had to go to the Romans to get Rome's blessing and Rome's approval for this. Again, this is a compare and contrast, as we mentioned earlier. He is comparing the Jewish leaders with Jesus. Jesus he does the will of God regardless. The Jewish leaders, they only do the will of God if they can get the permission of the Romans. Judas is, conv is convinced, uh, convicted of his guilt and decides to return the 30 pieces of silver. He seeks to take them to uh, the temple and return them to the religious leaders, and they say that they cannot be accepted. 
Um, well, they at first tell him this is your responsibility. So, uh, you know, what? in other words, they're saying, you know, that's your problem, Judas. So Judas throws the money in the temple, goes out and hangs himself. And then the chief priests pick up the coins, and they have the whole issue of what they're going to do with the money. They say that they can't put it back into the temple treasury because it is blood money. Because it was associated for someone's death. Matthew, who is a Jew himself, he is constantly doing this in his Gospels. He's constantly putting in little zingers that make the chief priest look bad. He's constantly pointing out their hypocrisy. What a hypocrisy to say, Oh, we can't touch this money because it's blood money. When they are the actual ones who gave the blood money and actually had, uh, uh, were using it to have someone uh, killed. But we must go back to uh, Judas for a moment. Judas is going to go out and to hang himself. Again, there is another compare and contrast that is going on here. Judas is being compared with Peter. Peter is going to deny Jesus and is going to go out and weep bitterly. Judas is going to deny Jesus and go out and hang himself. For Judas, it's the end of the story. For Peter, for those that know, there is more story to follow. Peter will find forgiveness, and Peter will find redemption, and Peter will become one of the great leaders of the church. So what is the difference between Peter and Judas? They both denied Jesus, and perhaps Judas' betrayal is, is a bit more severe. But could not Judas have been forgiven? Yes, I believe he could. The difference between Peter and Judas is that Peter will seek Jesus' forgiveness and Judas will not. This is a lesson for us today. It is not how great of a crime or how great of a sin we have committed that seals our fate. What seals our fate is when we get to the point where we don't believe and seek for Jesus' forgiveness. Let's move on in the story. Beginning with verse 11. Jesus before Pilate. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. And when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony that they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priest at the crowd, to ask for Barabbas, and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, that instead of an uproar was starting. 
He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. Am I innocent? I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. One of the things that we notice is that the man, Pilate, the governor, who is responsible for Jesus' uh, the charge, uh, the official decree for him to be sentenced uh, to death, is that Pilate himself personally did not want to crucify Jesus. As we read the other accounts, we see it's obvious that he didn't think that there was sufficient evidence to warrant Jesus' death penalty. In fact, later, uh, as we just read previously, when they said crucify him, Pilate's answer is, why? What crime has he committed to deserve such a death? Also, his wife had a dream. You might not think so much about dreams today, but people in Jesus' day took dreams very seriously. And his wife had a very, um, a very strong sense that Jesus should not be punished based upon that dream. For him, it would have been a matter of, if you will, bad luck to carry out this crucifixion after his wife had had the dream. The other thing that we see in regards to Pilate not wanting to sentence him to death is that he sought a way out. He, Pilate says, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a choice. Where it won't really be me choosing, but I'll let you, the people, choose. I'll let you choose between two different people. You notice that they're both called Jesus. Jesus Barabbas and Jesus who is called the Messiah. Jesus was a very common name, just like John or Peter or Michael are common names today. And so, in fact, what he was saying to the crowd is, which Jesus do you want? Do you want Jesus the murderer and the uh, insurrectionist? the violent man? Or do you want Jesus who calls himself the Messiah and preaches a message of love and peace? And the Jewish people who are God's chosen people, God's especially chosen people, remarkably choose Jesus, the murderer and insurrectionist. And Pilate asks, so what should I do with Jesus? And they say, crucify him. Crucify him. And Pilate is protesting, but why? What has he done? And it says, they cried even louder, crucify him. You notice Pilate asked them a question, what has he done? And they did not answer. They did not produce any evidence. They just continued to insist. If you were Pilate, the Roman governor, governor, you had a great deal of power. And as Jewish people, you were a subjugated people, and you did not have a great deal of power. But even as subjugated people, one of the powers that you had is to threaten a revolt. Do you see, Pilate, he was sensing that things were getting out of hand. You remember the crowds that are in Jerusalem. A normal city of maybe 100,000 is now a million and if a revolt breaks out now, then that's bad news for the Romans. And Pilate is very afraid of a revolt breaking out. So although he doesn't want to crucify Jesus, he agrees to let it be done. Pilate gave in to fear. Yet Jesus did not. You see, the one man who was supposed to have power to do whatever he want proved to have no power at all. And the man 
Jesus, who appeared to have no power, just a mere carpenter bound and beaten, who appeared to have no power, he was totally in control of the situation. Pilate will seek to absolve himself. He does not want to bear the guilt for this man's blood. So he washes his hands and said, I am innocent. But the truth of the matter is, you cannot wash your hands and declare you are innocent and make yourself innocent. In his commentary on the, on the Gospel of Matthew, William Barclay says, There is one thing of which a man can never rid himself, and that is responsibility. It is never possible for Pilate or anyone else to say, I wash my hands of all responsibility, for that is something that no one and nothing can take away. Pilate must not have wished to have had to make the decision about what to do with Jesus. Indeed, we know he didn't want to make this decision. We see in Luke's Gospel that Pilate will send him away to Herod, hoping that Herod will make a decision, King Herod will make a decision, only to have King Herod say, no, I don't really see anything here. I'm going to send him back with you, Pilate, and make you um, make the decision. He did not want to make the decision. He did not want to have the responsibility of what to do, the responsibility for what to do with this man, Jesus. But he was put in a situation where he had to make a decision. The same thing is true with the other people in the crowd. They had to make a decision about what they would do with Jesus. People today may not want to make a decision about Jesus, but they must make a decision. And everyone will be it will be responsible for the decision that they made about Jesus. Someone will say, well, I'm indifferent about Jesus. I won't make a decision. I just refuse to make a decision. But when you refuse to accept Jesus, you have, in effect, rejected Jesus. We all have to make a decision about what we're going to do with Jesus as the king of our life. And we will bear responsibility for what kind of decision that we make. Now we're going on to the next section. The soldiers mock Jesus, beginning in verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the platorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hell, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After that, they mocked. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Well, the rejection and the ridicule for Jesus keeps piling on. It has started with Jesus, one of his own disciples who he had loved for three years and taught and and directed and, and took him care of for three years, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Peter, who claimed that he would never deny Jesus, denies Jesus three times. The Jewish leaders who should have accepted Jesus as their rightful king have rejected him and plotted to have him killed. And in fact, uh, the high priest himself struck Jesus. And then Pilate is going to reject him, and Herod is going to reject him, and then back to Pilate to be rejected again. And now all the soldiers are coming to ridicule him again. Most of what they are going to do, yes, they are going to hit him, uh, uh, and which would have caused some, some physical pain, I suppose. But most of what they are doing 
is a, ma a matter of humiliation. He claimed to be king, so we will treat him like king. Oh, why are you wearing this common man's clothes when you're supposed to be a king? Here, let us help you. And they tear off all of his clothes in public in front of everyone else, rip them off. And then they put on a purple robe on him. That's what a king would wear. And then, you know, you need a, you need a king needs a scepter. So we'll put a staff in your right hand. And so they put a stick in his right hand. And then they actually knelt down in front of him. They actually, they actually played this out and just made a big game of it. And then they started to despise him. They spit on him. They spit in his face. This is not the first time that this has happened. It happened with the Jewish leaders as well. And then it says, after they mocked him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes on him, and then they led him away to be crucified. Our next section begins in verse 32, the crucifixion of Jesus. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, who offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the charge, the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their fist, uh, shaking their heads, excuse me, and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. As they're going to the crucifixion, they're going to a place that is called the Place of the Skull. It's called the Place of the Skull because the hillside where this takes place on uh, sort of looks or looks like a skull. And also, it is a place of death and execution. As they're going along the way, the soldiers are going to force a man to help Jesus. It's very unlikely that the soldiers are feeling any kind of sympathy for Jesus and want to genuinely help. The more likely explanation is that Jesus has become so weak that he needs existence, and the soldiers want to get the show on the road. And so they, in, uh, they invite, or they command Simon of Cyrene to assist him. Jesus would have been very weak. You remember uh, back in verse 26 that they had flogged Jesus. The gospel writers, when they use words like flogged or crucified, they don't give a lot of details about exactly what happened because everyone in Jesus' day knew exactly what it meant to be flogged and exactly what it meant to be crucified. So they didn't spend a lot of time with the gory details. But you and I today often may not know what it means to be flogged or to be crucified. So to be flogged, you would have your clothes stripped off of you, and you'd be tied. Uh, you'd have your arms wrapped around uh, a big post and tied, and you'd be tied to the post. And then they would use a whip, a whip that was called the cat of nine tails. It had nine, nine leather straps, and in the end of the straps were little pieces of bone, sharp bone, and little pieces of lead, and anything that was sharp. And so when you were flogged or you were struck with the whip, these little pieces of bone or lead would sink into your back, and then 
the str the strips of, of leather would just be hanging there from your back and then the soldier would yank them out and when he yanked them out then he would flesh would be pulled uh, from your back so after being flogged you the back uh, your back would become just like a raw piece of meat and often you would lose uh, lots of blood uh, sometimes men would go into shock after being flogged uh, others would even die after uh, being flogged so Jesus in carrying the cross when we say he's carrying the cross he would be carrying uh, one of the cross members uh, uh, of the cross and the other piece would be at the crucifixion site uh, and so he is weak and he falls under the load and Simon of Cyrene is forced to come in. It is interesting to know a little something about Simon of Cyrene. He comes from uh, North Africa, so he was an African man. Uh, also, we're told, uh, we're also told in one of the other Gospels that he is the father of Alexander and Rufus. And it's, uh, scholars have wondered why they would uh, include these names. And the explanation that is most common is, is that the early Christians probably knew Alexander and Rufus. And in fact, it is believed that they would later become members of the church. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 13, when Paul is giving his greetings, to uh, the church at Rome, he mentions Rufus. It could be the very son of Simon of Cyrene. We also notice that uh, the text, as I mentioned before, doesn't give a lot of details when we come to the word crucify. It just says they crucified him. Because the people in that day knew what that meant. So, this would involve laying Jesus out on the cross. It would involve nailing his hands. It, they used the word hands. It would have actually been through his uh, wrist. And then perhaps putting his two feet together and nailing uh, the two feet together to, to the cross. And then uh, a group of men would pick up the cross from behind. On the other side, there would be some ropes that would help to pull the cross upright. And when they got the cross upright, they would there would be a hole in the ground and they would move it over to it fell in the hole. And then Jesus nailed to this cross would have been jarred as the cross fell into the hole. The process that a person goes through in being crucified is, is how that you are positioned uh, on the cross makes it extremely difficult to breathe. And so you will have to push up with your feet and pull up with your arms, of course, against the nails that are there. And you have to endure the pain while you're pushing up to be able to push up and to breathe. So you'll push up and endure the pain as long as you can and try to breathe and then to let the pain subside, you will let yourself down. And when you let yourself down, uh, you will not be able to breathe again. And that raw back would be going up and down against the cross all day long. We notice in our section that we just read that there are two... Thieves are, in my translation, it says to rebels, to criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and they actually join in the crowd in the insults. Now, we, we do know uh, from the other Gospels, Matthew does not record it, but we know from the other Gospels, that one of the thieves has a change of heart and repents and asks for forgiveness and says, Lord, 
Remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus utters the words, Today you will be with me in paradise. Let's move on to the next section, beginning with verse 45, the death of Jesus. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs opened. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tomb after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him regarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. We have Jesus uttering the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The text actually gives us Jesus' words in the original language in which he spoke them, which would have been Aramaic. You might not be familiar with Aramaic. We normally talk about, in the Bible, about two languages, Hebrew in the Old Testament, and Greek in the New Testament. But the Jews of Jesus' day had been in exile for hundreds and hundreds of years. And while some of their scribes and, and even some of their people learned how to, to go to the synagogue and to read the scriptures in Hebrew and New Hebrew, on a daily basis, they spoke a language called Aramaic. And so this would be Jesus' language that he would have grown up knowing, his first language that he would have grown up knowing as a child, the language of his heart. And his words mean, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This statement by Jesus has raised much discussion and much debate. Could it be true that Jesus was really forsaken by God. Could it be true that he had forsaken him? Some will say yes. Some will say no. We should note that these words are actually the first verse of Psalm chapter 22. And if you read Psalm chapter 22, a song of David, David begins, starting out in the beginning, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But as you keep reading the psalm, you come to the end. David has a confidence in God and a confidence that God will deliver him. Many times amongst the Jews, it was common that if you wanted to share a, a thought from a particular passage of the Old Testament, that you would read or would you would uh, recite the first verse of a psalm or of a chapter and it would bring into remembrance to everyone that knew it, knew where it came from the whole chapter. Perhaps this is what Jesus was doing. Yes, he was really feeling the pain of being rejected and forsaken. But I believe he still had a calm confidence that God was going to deliver him. In verse 50, the scripture says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. To give up his spirit means 
his physical body died. But it says he cried out in a loud voice. But Matthew does not tell us what he cried out or what he said. But if we go to the Gospel of John, we will find out what Jesus said. In John chapter 19 and verse 30, it says he cried out, It is finished. It is finished. The expression, it is finished, is the expression of a victor. It is the expression of one who has won. One who has won the battle. One who has won the race. The one who has accomplished what he was sent to do. If you had to put it in our language today, Jesus would have said, I have done it. I did it. I accomplished what Jesus, what God has sent me to do. Has sent me to do. There's a common view that's passed around in Christianity that I would like to challenge. There's a common view in Christianity that says, Friday is just the dark day where Satan did all of his dirty business and Satan won. But on Sunday, God's going to win and reverse everything. I don't believe that this is correct. You see, Jesus actually won on Friday. Yes, the resurrection will validate that and it will prove that. But the victory was actually one on Friday. That's the reason it is Good Friday. Jesus won. See, the resurrection, the resurrection didn't accomplish our salvation. It was a demonstration of it. Romans chapter 1 and verse 3 says that Jesus was declared to be God's son by the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection didn't make him God's son, but it declared him or it showed to people that he really was. You see, a lot of people, it's, it's like Jesus died on the cross and oh, now it looks like Satan is one. In heaven's view, when Jesus died on the cross, there was no doubt that Jesus had already won. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 24, it says, It was impossible for death to hold him. What does it mean? It means is that when Jesus died on the cross, and, and gave that full and complete obedience to God and that sacrifice that pleased God, he had one. And one that is the Son of God, there was no question whether he was going to get up out of the grave or not. It was impossible for death to keep hold on him. You see... So much was finished, so much was done at the cross, so much was completed at the cross. Our salvation was purchased, Satan was defeated, redemption was secured, reconciliation was made available, a new and a better covenant had been brought into effect, our sins were atoned for, that once and for all sacrifice for sins was made. You could go on and on. I invite you to read through the whole New Testament sometime and just make a look for all the different things that it says that Jesus accomplished on the cross. And the list will truly astonish you. 
So this day that begins out of an unfair trial, this day that sees Jesus ridiculed and mocked and beaten and tortured, tortured is really a mild word, tortured so cruelly upon the cross, is actually the day he won. And for that reason, it is Good Friday. All right, we have one other small section that takes place upon Friday, and that is his burial. The We will read about this starting in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself became a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body in order that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a linen, clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite of the tomb. Joseph of Arimathea is a rich man. We learn from the other gospel accounts that he is also a member of the ruling council or of the Sanhedrin. You remember that that is the same group that condemned Jesus in the middle of last night. But it also tells us that Joseph did not consent to their decision. You remember the Sanhedrin was called in the middle of the night, which was an illegal proceeding. And so very likely, not all of the members were there, probably including Joseph. But Joseph is now going to go to Pilate and ask for permission to take the, bio, the, the body and to bury the body. And he takes it and he places it in a new tomb. That's very important for several reasons. Uh, a new tomb is quite expensive. Tombs were dug in the side of rock on a hillside. There was not modern machinery as we have today, so it had to be dug out by hand, which was t quite time consuming. Most tombs were family tombs. You go in, you put one body, you roll the stone, and then then when you have the next death in the family, you roll the stone back, you put another family member in, you could have multiple people in the same, uh, in the same tomb. So to put Jesus in a tomb that had never been used before was quite an expense for Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus, if you want to put it this way, is Jesus has been abused all day but now finally in his death he is being treated with respect and the honor that he is due. It is also to fulfill prophecy which spoke about him being buried with the rich. It is also significant because later when we have all the talk about the resurrection and people trying to say um, that Jesus really was not raised from the dead, there is going to be all kinds of things that they're going to try to say. They're going to try to say, well, you know, you, you got him mixed up with someone else's body that's in a family tomb. But no, this was a new tomb. Are they going to say, well, when you went back to the tomb, you went to the wrong tomb. But here in the text, we have witnesses that have come along and seen where all of this takes place. You might, a little tidbit that you might not know, but Joseph of Arimathea has another named helper. 
uh, in John's Gospel, it tells us that he was helped by Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus, he's the one that came to Jesus by night. He is going to come and to honor Jesus in his death. They take spices, about 75 pounds that we learn from the other gospel accounts, and wrap them around his, his body. And uh, this is uh, important for several reasons. One is, is that it shows they were very expensive and it shows a great deal of honor. Uh, but also, there is going to be the accusation made that when Jesus was put in the tomb, he was not really dead. But he was put in the tomb, and then he later revived and just perked back up. But if in handling the body and cleaning the body and packing all these spices that were very strong and aromatic, if he didn't wake up then, then it's unlikely that he would wake up at all. He was truly, he was truly dead when they put him in the tomb. So many of the details that are here in this last little section may seem to be insignificant. But later on, when we get to the resurrection, and to those that are going to say the resurrection didn't happen, these details in this little short section are very strong proof that Jesus indeed did die, indeed was buried, and indeed was resurrected. That completes Friday of the Passion Week, the most holy day when Jesus died on the Holy Cross. Tomorrow we will be back once again, and it will be Saturday. It will be the Jewish Sabbath day. I've never taught, on the, to my recollection, on the events that the Bible says happened on the Jewish Sabbath. Sabbath day of Passion Week. I challenge you to uh, look through all four Gospels and see if you can find what event that might be. I hope you're up for the challenge and I hope you have a wonderful evening and I hope that you will uh, go out for the rest of your evening and the rest of your week with a realization of what Jesus has done for us. Good night.